We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Thank you so much for coming to our workshop. Um, this is going to be the Dynama Coalition of uh, Accessibility and Disability uh, workshop. Um, I know we're going to get a lot of stragglers in from lunch, so um, people just join in virtually, uh, physically. Um, but uh, we wanted to keep to the time because we're very short on time. Um, but if others want in the back want to come up to the table, feel free to do that. Okay. Um, so thanks again for coming. Um, the Dynama Coalition it has been started set many years ago, and we're working within the IGF to improve access and, and accessibility. Uh, many of our projects have been working on uh, how to, especially in the, in the virtual world, when we're on Zoom, how to make sure that people um, with persons with disabilities or specific needs can actually um, come to the workshop and access them. Um, and the Zoom platform is one of our bigger successes that we've had. They used to, IGF used to use the, the uh, WebEx platform. Um, and also uh, we work to help on the advice on, on different formats and webinars and also on meeting format as well as other documentation on accessibility and making sure that websites are accessible. But um, we are now going to, uh, the, that, this is our main uh, session. The Dynamic Coalition is one, uh, our Dynamic Coalition is one of the many other different Dynamic Coalitions that work throughout the year on the IGF. Um, the main session of the Dynamic Coalitions as a group is tomorrow morning, if you want to come. Um, it's tomorrow. It's more. Uh, it's uh, uh, nine thirty in the morning in Central European time in the plenary room. Um, we are also then uh, meeting different times a year. And if you're interested in joining Dynamic Coalition, um, Jolly will post the or someone else will post the link into the Zoom chat, and that way you could actually join our group and get more involved. We would love to have you. Um, we have several panelists on the schedule today. We have Gunilla Asprink. Um, she is currently a MAG member, gonna be leaving after this term, um, but she's also very, been very active on accessibility issues. Uh, many of the same members of the DCAD are also very active within Internet Society. Um, through the Internet Society, um, special interest group on accessibility, which is the project of ISOC New York. Um, also will be uh, on the ISOC standing group on accessibility and disability. Um, but so Gunilla is gonna be talking about her experiences, both on the MAG and on accessibility issues. We have Mohammed Shabir. Mohammed Shabir is now an ISOC board member. He was one of our founders of the accessibility special interest group. Uh, and he, we are also then having um, Lydia Best. Uh, she's Polish and she's been uh, based in the UK and working on ha heading up besides being uh, very active in the ITU, working on their accessibility group work. She's also the uh, chairwoman of the different hard of hearing associations. Uh, we then also have uh, Judy O'Keefe, and she is a disability advocate in Kenya, and she's been also very active in the, in the DCAD and working with the DCAD member, uh, trying to be a liaison, helping create liaison groups with different other DCAD members, and as well as some of our special projects, which were working with the other IGFs, other ISAC organizations, and people, and regional and national. I, 
IGFs to make sure that accessibility is is up is considered when the when they're scheduling their events, because after an event is scheduled, it's difficult to um, include accessibility if it's not in the get-go. Um, so she's been working on that area. And I think I will go to uh, the panelists now, and um, I don't exactly remember the order, but Gunilla, I think you might have been first. Okay. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. So um, I just like to start um, by uh, recognizing that the last week was uh, the International Day of Persons with Disability on the 3rd of December. And the theme of uh, this year's day was leadership and participation of persons with disabilities towards an inclusive, accessible and sustainable post-COVID-19 world. That's quite a long name for the theme, but uh, we all recognise, and as Judith said, that persons with disability um, are often very disadvantaged and we find that in this COVID world that there are more and more disadvantage and, uh, and it just highlights the inaccessibility of some online tools that um, uh, enable persons with disability to communicate. And the particular um, the particular saying or in the disability movement is nothing about us without us. And it really means that persons with disability need to be involved uh, within an organization, um, working to improve accessibility in various ways. And, and so uh, we have DCAD um, working with IGF and, and, uh, and certainly um, the particular special interest group and the standing group on accessibility with the Internet Society. So it's making an organization accessible from the ground up, meaning that policies, programs and communications will take into account the needs of persons with disability. And that means, for example, that websites and document systems are accessible and staff understand accessibility requirements, which is really important. Also identifying a disability champion at the senior level of an organization makes a real difference. And including persons with disability on boards means there's a disability voice at the strategic level of the organization. And this is a, a great example where Mohammed Shabi Awan, who has a vision impairment, um, is now on the Internet Society's Board of Trustees to influence at the top level of internet policy. I'd also just like to mention quickly um, examples from Australia about leadership um, projects. Um, the Women with Disabilities Australia, of which I'm a member, has um, a project called LEAD, and L-E-A-D stands for Lead, Engage, Activate, and Drive. And this is building leadership skills from the ground up for women with disabilities. And, and uh, maybe in future, there will be uh, some women with disabilities from Australia, uh, more than myself, uh, who will be joining uh, some of these um, sessions. And we definitely need more leadership initiatives uh, in the internet governance space. So um, to, to continue on and talk about accessibility at the IGF, um, um, as I leave the um, IGF um, MAG, the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, it's essential that future MAG members also have accessibility and lived experience of disability. So as I left the um, MAG, I made a number of suggestions. And, and that is in relation to the uh, UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, 
which was launched by the UN uh, Secretary General in 2019, um, there, there are a number of um, recommendations, uh, certainly in the 2021 uh, report that was released in October. And, uh, and that again talks about embedding disability inclusion in strategic plans and establishing institutional ownership, building the knowledge and capacities of staff on disability inclusion, improving physical and disability and, and digital accessibility, and supporting the meaningful participation of persons with disabilities and their representative organizations. So relating this to um, the IGF, um, I've suggested that the, um, there be a comprehensive website accessibility evaluation and possible remediation based on that evaluation. And that evaluation should be done by persons with disability who can report accessibility area, errors. And so it's a matter of finding the right company to that specializes um, in website accessibility and employs persons with disability to undertake such a task. And, and thirdly, to, uh, secondly, sorry, to run webinars for the IGF community when writing and uploading content to the IGF website, because it's one thing to have an accessible website from the start, but if, if um, members of a community uh, are not um, familiar with making sure that their content is accessible when it gets uploaded to the website, then gradually there will be a deterioration of accessibility. So it's a matter again of building awareness and running some webinars um, about that. And thirdly, um, is developing and, uh, and applying what I call a disability um, accessibility filter policy when planning any new online tools. So again, any, any new tool should be developed by a company that has documented experience in accessibility and staff with disability to test the tools. And actually, this sort of requirement could be part of tender documentation. And we, we know that there's um, a guideline, Section 508 guidelines in the US, and a European standard that covers ICT accessibility in public procurement, in other words, government purchasing. And, uh, and as governments influence this, it helps the, the marketplace and the suppliers make more accessible products. So they are some of my key points. And uh, um, I will uh, bring it back to Judith. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gunilla. Uh, I know you've been doing great work for, with the MAG and it'll be a big loss not to have you there, but um, hopefully the MAG will get some other people. We, knew, we do know that um, some other great champions of accessibility are coming on the MAG, namely Sherry Lakagali from the Pacific Islands, and hopefully she can help take up the mantle. And um, Dot Asia, I know, is a big supporter of accessibility and disability. So hopefully they also will help champion that cause because I think they are continuing on the mag as well. So without due accord, I will cut the panels. We only have an hour. We want to leave time for some questions in, from the audience. So I will move on to um, Mohammed Shabir. Shabir, can you take the floor now? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judith. And taking the lead uh, from uh, what Ganella has said, and I would actually like to thank her for making my job easier, uh, for, for establishing uh, and setting the ground for me uh, to talk about accessibility uh, for persons with disabilities and uh, about the issues that they face in different parts of the world and uh, in the organizations. Uh, firstly, uh, there are a couple of points I would like to make, but I would like to apologize that I don't have uh, any slides, so I would like to uh, speak directly to the audience. Uh, firstly, uh, the 
uh, nothing about us without us uh, should not just be a tagline. And this line uh, requires Uh, this line uh, requires that uh, the the person with disabilities they are included in uh, planning, uh, implementation, and evaluation part of the uh, uh, evaluation part of the uh, of the uh, any project that an organization runs. And talking about the experience of uh, UN and DICAD, there has been a lot of wonderful work that uh, has been uh, carried out uh, by the, the by the DICAD at the IGF. Uh, but uh, I would like to talk about the uh, national uh, regional uh, internet governance forums and their accessibility. Uh, at APR IGF, uh, Asia Pacific Regional Inter Internet Governance Forum, I, I know that there have been uh, uh, some uh, uh, people with disabilities, including Ganella and myself, who, who have advocated for uh, the accessibility of the regional forum. And at national uh, levels, there are uh, some countries where the accessibility of people with disabilities uh, have been uh, carried out. Uh, but then there are uh, some countries where uh, this uh, part is lacking, uh, mainly in, uh, in Asia and Africa. Uh, not just Asia and Africa, in some parts of the uh, Latin America as well. Uh, also, uh, with regards to uh, the, the, the second point that uh, comes to uh, mind with uh, this is the training part of the uh, governance uh, leadership. And, and the groundwork that has been done mainly is the schools on internet governance. Again, uh, a couple of uh, schools, they have had the uh, sessions and uh, participants and speakers, uh, those who have uh, or have the experience of uh, living uh, with disability and experience as well. Uh, but then uh, there are schools uh, which have not been uh, forthcoming uh, when it comes to accessibility uh, agenda. Uh, then is the uh, organization. And if I talk about the organizations uh, is uh, the I-STAR organization. Uh, there has been a lot of good work uh, done by the by these organizations, including Internet Society, ITU, United Nations, and and uh, ICANN, and all those organizations. But uh, this work needs to be uh, structured uh, and structured in a way where uh, from bottom to top and top bottom approaches are applied uh, at at different policy planning and implementation levels. Uh, if I give uh, the example of Internet Society, I, uh, as a person uh, with disability, uh, happen to be the first elected uh, member board of trustees of the Internet Society. And by the way, uh, when I speak here, I speak as uh, Muhammad Shabir and not uh, from the uh, perspective of the Internet Society. These are my uh, own opinions. So uh, I happen to be the first one uh, elected uh, by the chapters at the Internet Society who uh, happens to have any uh, kind of lived experience uh, with disability. Uh, but Internet Society, uh, as we all know, uh, for long have been doing a lot of work with regards to uh, people with disabilities and making the internet accessible, uh, dig digital domain particularly accessible in different parts and regions uh, of the world. We uh, also heard that there is uh, the standing group on accessibility. And then uh, there is also a project of New York, which is the special interest group on accessibility. So all these ventures, they are there, uh, but uh, what is lacking in internet governance uh, discussions is the actual participation of people with disabilities. Uh, and this uh, brings me uh, to the second part of my, uh, my discussion, uh, which is very important as well. 
uh, as as a person with disability, if I uh, stand here uh, and if I claim that nothing about us should uh, be without us, then uh, it it should be the responsibility of me uh, to to participate in these kind of discussions. And and what is uh, what is observed is that in these discussions uh, there is a, a less participation of uh, people with. Uh, disabilities in in IGF, uh, in in NRIs, and in the uh, school and internet governances. Uh, there could be uh, multiple reasons for that. Uh, I will uh, not go into into those details uh, here. If there is an interest, we can discuss this in the latter part of this session. But what needs to be highlighted here is that uh, people uh, who have lived experience of disabilities, the organizations, those who work uh, for uh, people with disabilities, they need to uh, be proactive in becoming a part of uh, these discussions. Uh, my last point uh, relates to uh, Ganela's uh, earlier point that there is uh, a need to, to strategize this and strategize this uh, from the top leadership level uh, with response to the championing or having a champion uh, with uh, regard to accessibility. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, on, on one hand, it's, it's fortunate that uh, UN Secretary General started a new inclusion strategy back in 2019. But it is unfortunate uh, that, that uh, uh, when uh, the new IGF leadership panel uh, was announced, there was no person with uh, disability uh, on that panel. So uh, this could have been avoided and uh, coming from the top, the message could have been uh, very forthcoming and very pronounced had there been uh, a person uh, with lived experience of disability uh, appointed or promoted to, to that level. But unfortunately, this could not happen. We can just hope that, that in the future, uh, this could be uh, rectified. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, accessibility is, uh, and di digital accessibility is something uh, which uh, we often say that needs to happen. Uh, I say that it is, it is uh, unavoidable. And we, we can not, not have the digital domains accessible for everyone because this is uh, by the humans and for the humans. And humans themselves can make it, uh, make it accessible for everyone if there is a will and desire. And if there is no will and no desire, then uh, the, the, uh, nothing can make the internet uh, platforms and the digital domains accessible. But uh, if there is no will or desire, we uh, today we should not think just about that. This is for for ev for every other person, but not for us. Even if we today do not need it or may not need accessibility platforms or platforms which are accessible for different. Uh, uh, people who have uh, different disabilities tomorrow or the day after uh, may need it. So physical and temporary uh, disabilities, which may be temporary or which may be permanent, may uh, occur and catch to anyone anywhere in any part of the life. And as we age, we need uh, these uh, accessibility requirements more and more. So uh, my, my just a humble suggestion to those who would uh, say that we, okay, we do not need it, so why do we? Uh, would be to that today uh, they may not need it, but, uh, but uh, God forbid that if tomorrow and the day after you need it and you not have it, then uh, there would be uh, no use or crying uh, spilled milk. So with this, I, I rest my case and back to you guys. Shabir, thanks so much for your remarks. Um, and I know Shabir is trying to uh, work from the inside out to change. 
um, because you can work from the outside, but if you, the best chances of, of making change are working from inside the system and getting change to happen. And slowly but surely, we are doing that, um, working with different organizations, both within the IGF and others, and trying to convince others to of the need to uh, to do accessibility. And as he pointed out, main people captioning is not for only for people with uh, disabilities. It's also for people whose first language is not English, and it's also for people who have limited bandwidth who can't see the videos. So that is also um, one of the universal aspects of accessibility. Same is true for a lot of different other things. Um, people, as they get older, they lose some vision and they need uh, to have screens made bigger or other things. So there's a lot of different ideas of what needed for accessibility. Um, I will next bring it off to our next panelist, Lydia Best. Um, and Lydia, you can take it away. Thanks, Lydia. Thank you, Judith. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK, wonderful. Um, so as Judith has uh, mentioned, and first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and inviting me to be part of a, a meeting. But it is a huge privilege for me to be able to address um, while I am in England, actually a host country, which is Poland, the country of my birth, where I spent my, my, my formative years. Um, at the moment, I'm also a vice chair of um, JCAAHF at ITU, which stands for Joint Coalition Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors at International Telecommunication Union. And I'm also part um, of this um, group of Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability. I would like to start first before I talk about general accessibility um, and build on what my previous speakers have said on language, language and perceptions of disability, where we do require as well a leadership um, to ensure that people with disabilities are fully understood. In case of people who are hard of hearing and deafened, I wear cochlear implant for many years, I used to wear hearing aids. In our case, there is predominant assumption that medicine fix us, basically. This is especially a um, very strong kind of assumption, which I have noted in, the U in Poland. I don't see it as so much in the UK. And that brings an issue of lack of accessibility, lack of understanding that people who are hard of hearing, well, yes, the devices are life-changing and supporting them. They are allowing them to hear, but not always fully understand, especially digital voices and digital meetings. And therefore, they need additional support such as assistive listening device, and especially when it comes to the internet captioning. Now, um, despite those efforts to improve awareness and access of the needs of hard of hearing people, we still observe the resistance of providing given the basic access um, in many areas of public life. So most notably when it comes to public announcements, when it came to the COVID pandemic, I have observed many countries, Poland included, which were not providing the live captioning to the hard of hearing citizens. They also were not providing them on actual internet platforms. There also seems to be a lot of misconception around policymakers. And despite the advance, advances, we are not using the technology which is available. But now, while English language users do enjoy long history of investment in training of real-time captioners who, are we, who we are using today at this meeting and all the meetings of IGF, we speakers, and also we are using sometimes automated captioning depending on whatever situation people use, users of minority languages such as Polish language do not get that and they are still excluded from the participation in the society. I have just 
checked with some of the um, Polish people by a social media if this meeting is accessible to them in Polish language, and they said no. Perhaps that there is a room for improvement with different hosts of different countries. But to make that room for improvement, we have to ensure that there is a real leadership which promotes training of professionals providing captioning. At the same time, promotes the legislation and policy which includes captioning, sign language, and any other accessibility which should be afforded to citizens with disabilities in the country. And in addition, funding and investment towards the developing the accessibility in the native languages, the minority languages specifically. In countries which are as well like Poland, are, are ex excluding persons with disabilities, which make up around 15% of the society, are not yet fully inclusive. Despite signing up to CRPD, um, United Nations Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities articles, such as 9 and 30, which both relate to access to information. Lastly, we would like to see the involvement of a person with disabilities, a real meaningful involvement in developing policies and developing training, etc. Any at any areas which we are working towards inclusive society. But please make sure that those kind of engagements are really meaningful and they provide accessibility. Those person with disabilities require. International Telecommunication Union has also published technical paper on accessibility, accessible meetings and in addition, a overview of remote captioning. It doesn't have to be only remote, it can be on the old side, but it provides some building blocks and information of what it means and what, which ways you can provide accessible meetings. However, that document is provided for the English language predominantly. We need similar guidances, similar quality papers in minority languages, so we can have a benchmarks to ensure that the full and real quality with accuracy of information is definitely provided to the society. One of the things I would like to um, touch on, it's something what, which I came across recently. Um, the Polish um, parliament is currently updating the legislation related to accessible elections. This is a great initiative and I really applaud it, but they, they are looking into it and making all the efforts to ensure that people with disabilities can have an accessible election and participate in elections. But there is a small but in here. There is not real focus on making sure that information is fully accessible to voters in Poland. There is still lack of um, live captioning as the provision of universal access. And that is something which I would like to synthesize and make others to, to to actually start putting their minds on and checking, are we fully accessible? Are we fully inclusive to our 15% of the society? So thank you very much. And I would not like to talk anymore. And Judith, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Lydia, for your insightful remarks. Yes, that is a thing. Um, I, in many other states, I know um, in the US, there are, are strict laws, but that is mostly caused by the different, uh, the, the uh, Disability Act, um, and as well as other communications laws, that certain number of hours have to be captioned, and that certain, and, and TV shows during primetime hours, and other movies or any other things. And so there's a big movement in the US to do this, but it all stems from a law and enforcement of the law. 
And so that is also something that other states have to look at, into of how do we do this? And um, if any other country is interested in that, the, uh, it, this program is administered by the Federal Communications Commission, which is the US regulator, and they have international visitors, and they, have, they can go through and host different um, topics for different countries on how they've worked on accessibility and disability issues. So they also have a fund to give out um, devices so that people with accessibility challenges can actually get low cost devices to watch TVs or, or other equipment. So uh, other countries in Poland and Europe have similar laws, but that is something that I think needs to be more ingrained into the population and ingrained into the law. Our last speaker for today is Judy Okite. She comes from Kenya. Um, and she has been working with the government there and others to work on accessibility. Um, and I did notice that um, since our effort in the past few years, many more countries in the national regional IGFs have been using either sign language interpretation or uh, captioning. Uh, one of the things, one of the main comments that came out from the NRI session yesterday was that a realization by some of the vet, some of the and uh, regional IGFs, especially in APR IGF, where they've always had human captioning, they tried this year to have um, AI captioning, and it did not work with well for them because uh, the AI is not yet there yet to determine and to work well with language with English spoken in foreign accents. Although humans don't have that issue as much. Machines do. Um, and so there's always a different learning curve on that. So Judy, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Judith. And uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope we are well. Am I, can I be heard? Yes. Thank you very much. OK. So I will just uh, continue from where my colleagues have left. Um, sorry, my name is Judy Okite. I come from Nairobi, Kenya. I will just continue from where my colleagues have left, uh, but I would like to take a different uh, angle to it and address the persons with disability themselves. Uh, many times when we talk about accessibility, we assume that every person with disability actually do understand what we are talking about. But many, or, or rather the challenges that I face is that whenever I am addressing uh, matters of accessibility more, more especially like here in Kenya, then we are not in the same page because the persons with disability themselves, they are not finding um, an issue with what it is that I'm talking about. And I'd like to take for an example, um, when I was advocating for ramps um, into buildings, I had a lot of backlash from the uh, disability community that uh, why would you be advocating for ramps? The steps work fine. They have been working fine for us. And that is one of the things that I would like to address that because you have a disability and you don't need this particular um, accessibility, uh, so to say, that we are talking about, doesn't mean that you need to shut it down. You should be able to, um, to support it. Because just as uh, um, uh, the previous speaker said, uh, Shabir, that because you do not need it, doesn't need, mean that somebody will not need it later. And so that has been um, a challenge here and so even when we're talking about um, digital accessibility, um, like just Lydia has mentioned about the captioning, um, you will find that um, the deaf community here do not agree that um, captioning is that important. So you find that we are fighting even amongst our, ourselves, whereas we should be um, all in the same page. 
so for me, I would say that there's a lot of um, capacity building that's, uh, that's needed, that's required, even for the persons with disability. We need to be able to understand our rights. So what rights do we have and uh, how can we advocate for them um, inclusively, all of us together? Um, when we are talking about digital accessibility, what exactly do we mean and um, how can we all advocate for it, whether it is affecting you directly or not? Um, when we want to um, bring together the community, we, we want the people who are outside of the disability community to understand us, then we also need to understand ourselves. We need to understand our needs, what it is that we want. Um, how can we forge this together as opposed to fighting um, one another? And, and just um, lastly on that, um, I would just like to mention, even as we advocate for accessibility, um, let's do it not just at a national level, let's do it at a regional level, Let's come to understand, um, are there digital, uh, sorry, uh, accessibility experts um, within our nations? Are there accessibility experts within our regions? How do we bring them together that we can all be able just to learn together, learn as persons with disability so that we can, um, after we have conversed and have one voice, then even as we go out and make and, and advocate, then it is one person talking, it is one voice talking so that we are not fragmented. We don't fragment ourselves within um, the same community. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, thanks Judy. So much. And also thanks so much for all your work you've been doing also with the NRIs and other work on accessibility and disabilities. Um, now is time for questions. Um, so we look to your virtual audience. Um, what questions you might have. Um, and if you could raise your virtual hand um, through the Zoom portal, um, if you're in, it is often found in the reaction comment section in the, um, in the computer down on the bottom or if you're in uh, the tablet, um, then it's underneath the three dots that say more. Uh, so we could ask for people to raise their hands and if they have any questions, and we'd love to call on you. Uh, so we'll wait a minute or two. Uh, but I think while waiting for hands, we might ask the first question to, um, to Shabir. Um, and what changes have you been able to make in your hope in your first year that you've been on the ISAC board? I know you're going to a second, uh, applying for a second year, and we hope that the chapters will reelect you. But I know you had you are making some other, um, working a lot of headway and making changes in the ISAC board, and so um, wanted to bring that to you and ask that question to you. Shabir, Shabir, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Uh, Judith, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, can you, uh, actually, I, uh, the voice for me was faded. So can you repeat your question? Sure. My question to you was, what change, during your first year on the ISAC board, what changes have you been able to make as, as being the first person with a, uh, with a disability on the board? Um, and if you could talk a little bit more about that. I think, because I know um, we have talked about that beforehand and just wanted to hear from you what change, how, how you've been working on that and changes you've been able to make. So uh, thank you very much for uh, this question. Yes, uh, there, 
as I said uh, in the beginning as well, that uh, Internet Society have been uh, working uh, for persons with disabilities and engaging uh, its dif through different chapters as well as its uh, regional offices as well. Uh, since I uh, joined uh, Internet Society Board, uh, uh, I uh, had a couple of purposes in my mind. Uh, one was to sensitize uh, the board and the senior leadership uh, through uh, personal e examples that accessibility is something which cannot be uh, put at the at the back burner and and be taken out when and uh, where it suits our interest. It has to be at the forefront and it has to be at the forefront of the organization. Uh, uh, by any means. So uh, in pursuant to, uh, I'm pursuing that quest, but I do understand that there is, uh, uh, there is organizational mindset that needs to be changed with regards to uh, digital accessibility of uh, person with disabilities when it comes to uh, the organization mindset. So for now, uh, I've, uh, I've asked for and uh, the board has started uh, captioning the open forum, uh, open sessions of the board meeting. Uh, I, each of these sessions is uh, now captioned and the uh, transcription uh, of those sessions is uh, and would be available uh, from, from now on uh, onto the uh, website of the Internet Society. Uh, for uh, 59 and 60th, uh, 159 and 160th meeting of the Internet Society Board, uh, which happened in July. And uh, then uh, this quarterly meeting, uh, the transcript for that should be available. Uh, what is my aim here? Uh, aim here is to have Internet Society or to uh, make Internet Society an organization where every policy, every procurement uh, document, every uh, RFP document considers uh, accessibility for person with disability. And Internet Society should have a person uh, employed as a staff or, uh, or an organization with uh, demonstrated work on accessibility for people with disabilities. Uh, their, their content and uh, their uh, message vetted as uh, they vet it from the legal point of view. Because if we consider a legal uh, requirement as compulsory for the organization to follow, same should be the case uh, for accessibility for the organization uh, to follow. If we achieve that level of accessibility within the organization, I would consider uh, my job done, but I, I uh, understand that that happy day uh, is uh, a little bit late and we, we may not see that happy day uh, very soon because of the, of the mindset and the uh, organization uh, culture that is uh, work at play. I hope this answers your question, Judith. Shabir, thanks so much. Um, we are going, we have a hand up from the Bangladesh Hub. Um, and so the Bangladesh Hub, um, please ask your question. I'm sorry, I was not I just want to know that, you know, during the pandemic situation, uh, we face lots of challenges, right? So we are thinking that we are in a new normal life. Uh, even though we face loads of challenges. Um, excuse me, uh, the interpreters and the captioners are having a hard time hearing you. So maybe if you can go closer to the microphone, that way oh. we, we can get them interpreted. Thank you very much for letting me know. So, you know, during pandemic, we face loads of challenges. Yeah. As a woman, or you know, any kind of disability, and then so we think that we are going to do not work. But even though, we 
Um, no, could, if you, if the, uh, there's a lot of distortion on the line, um, maybe you could actually put it in the chat and then I can read it aloud and we can get it answered for you. We're sorry about that. Yeah, that's also the problem in the remote hubs is that the audio sometimes is not as clear as it could be. Um, and the echoes of reverberations from them are making it even tougher for the, both the captioners and the others to hear it. Um, but we have to, we do have, one of the also points um, are that we didn't fail to mention is in the beginning, um, and we didn't have a speaker, but he's actually our, 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 our rapporteur is we also do not want to look, forget, people forget when they're looking, when they are focusing on accessibility issues, that it's not only people with a verbal impairment, uh, with, with a uh, hearing impairment or visual impairment, there's also cognitive issues. And the cognitive issues are also extremely important. And they often somehow get left off because uh, people, many people with cognitive impairments can hear and can, and, and can see, but they, have, they are not able uh, either to vocalize their comments or they, uh, that it is often a tougher um, thing for them to do. And many aspects, especially in Zoom, um, is that they type it in the chat and sometimes organizations say, oh, well, the chat is unofficial. Um, and that's why it's very important to sometimes read out the comments in the chat so that we don't forget about our people with uh, cognitive uh, impairments. And maybe um, we could ask uh, if Peter, if I don't want, I don't mean to put him on the spot, but if Peter wants to say anything, um, we would love to hear any comments from him. Oh, hi, um, am I there? Oh, it's, yes. uh, it, well, you put me on the spot. So <laughs> um, it, it, I think it's, it's very difficult to um, to summarize this. I think one of the main issues with, with cognitive accessibility to bear in mind is that cognitive disabilities are, are disproportionately representative amongst the young, mainly because it's something that you tend to be bo born with. So. Uh, there are more people or more children with cognitive disabilities than all the other disabilities put together. And that's where it has the greatest impact uh, in terms of uh, education. And now as we're seeing more and more th through COVID and so on, uh, online uh, education, uh, online accessibility is having a really uh, uh, the, the, the difficulties with digital accessibility are being exacerbated uh, amongst people with cognitive disabilities who are in education and in particular uh, with children. Um, so, and just to take up another point, yes, um, we, we have to be always aware that people will use different means of communicating. And um, uh, I know for, for many people like me who are autistic, we always tend to much prefer using text, for example, uh, than, than speaking. Uh, there are many people who, who, for whom verbal speech is not always uh, accessible. So uh, using chat and other forms of, of communication uh, are important. Thank you. Peter, thanks so much. Yes, and, and there's also, even in the verbal meetings, um, chat, some official ones are not considered official. Um, and there's, especially, I, I know I've been on ITU meetings where um, they say, oh, well, the, the chat is not official, so we're not gonna read it out, and we're not gonna put it in the record. And that is also something that people need to be trained on um, that there are people with disabilities who are posting in the chat because they can't verbalize or they can't 
get access or they lose access to the, to the uh, uh, transcription of other parts. And so those especially need to be verbalized. Um, and thanks to our Bangladesh chapter for writing in. The question is, um, in the last few minutes, is they asked, is that during the COVID pandemic, they, uh, dis people with disabilities, especially in Bangladesh, face lots of challenges, um, and especially in the health sector. And they are looking at um, how do we, over, besides the uh, education sector where schools were closed, is in the health sector, how do we overcome these challenges? And many of these were, um, they couldn't bring someone in with them to translate in the hospitals or in other places. Um, or they couldn't call someone on the phone. And then that often meant that they were denied coverage or they were denied service. Um, and those are also really uh, big challenges. And it, it, it's all about awareness. We have to raise awareness, just like we, in, when we first went to the Zoom platform, people were not aware that, oh, people with disabilities cannot see the screen. They cannot see documents that are on the screen that you need to give them a link um, for a document so they can actually view the document. Uh, many times it was that people were just not aware. They say, like, oh, I never thought about that. Okay, but then they have to keep being educated. And it's like, oh yes, I have to put that in the chat. I have to put the link in, or I have to send it out to people. Um, there was also issues of visual impairment in, in um, although a lot of the applications now have um, ability to put alternative text or other documents and describe images and describe videos. People are just not aware of how to do that. And that is also a major thing. Um, not that they don't want to do it. They would like to do it. They just are not aware of how they could do it. Um, and so uh, as we wrap up, I'm just going to look around uh, virtual audience and see if there's any other questions that people have and if they can come to the front in our last minute, um, we would love to hear from them. Uh, if not, um, it's been a great, it's sorry the meeting is so rushed, but we had uh, uh, only an hour time slot in here. So we uh, just love to hear from you. And if you're interested in joining the DCAD or the IGF accessibility uh, group, please let us know, post in that chat and our members will get back to you. But I just wanna make sure we bring this thing to the close um, because I know our time, everyone else's time is valuable and we have a lot of sessions that are going on back to back. Um, so uh, thanks so much and uh, help you join their other accessibility sessions in there. So look at them on the schedule and hopefully you can join them and work and we can make the community more accessible so that the internet will be for everyone and not just for people um, who don't have a disability. So thanks so much. <laughs>